This uh, webinar is all about inclusion and autism inclusion. So um, as you have both uh, worked and lived um, and, and your lives have been touched by autism, tell us um, please what uh, autism inclusion means to you, um, Robert, maybe as a parent, but also as a professional. You know, I think as a parent myself and, and speaking about many of the parents I talked to, that we all, when, when there's a person with autism in a family, in a sense, it becomes a family condition. The family is often excluded from so many things or feels excluded. And we all want to be included. So, I mean, that's, you know, kind of the journey I've been on. And, and there's a lot of situations in which uh, my son, because of his behavior, is not that welcome. Um, but it's always, it's always a pleasure to be around people who just treat him like a human being and not, you know, some sort of aberrant creature. Mm -hmm. You know, whether I'm out walking in the park and someone's saying hello, as opposed to getting distant. Well, now with COVID, like everybody's getting distant. So, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like a different world out here now. But, but at any rate, I think, you know, kids, teens, adults with autism want to be included. I was talking to a, a, a teenager the other day, I was doing a diagnostic evaluation and he has mild symptoms of autism. And um, I asked him if, if he had friends at school and he said, well, not really. I said, do you like people? And he said, oh, sure. And I said, do you do things with people? He said, not that often. I want to, he literally said, I want to be included. But, and I said, do you know how to ask for it? And he said, no, I really don't know how to ask for it. And I said, well, that's what we're going to learn about. And I, you know, and I talked to his parents about that, about putting him into situations where he could learn how to ask to be included. He, he likes it when his mom sets up a situation for him to play video games with his friend or, or play chess or, or, or whatever his favorite activities. Um, but he wants to be included more. So, so that's the, the, a skill for him to work on. So that's just some brief insight from my life and work. Thank you, thank you so much. And actually, I think that probably rings true with so many people, um, so many parents and so many individuals as well. Um, I think probably even from an educator's perspective, even um, from your professional perspective, um, everybody you know wants that, everybody that works around um, people with autism and also people um, that, you know, who, who work um, within these organizations, you know, it, it seems so, um, seems so easy when we talk about it like this. And it seems so, um, I think it seems so, such a shame that it doesn't happen, you know, uh, organically. So um, it's great to get your perspective. Thank you. And Stephen, over to you, what does in inclusion, autism inclusion mean to you? Successful inclusion, uh, meaningful inclusion uh, occurs when both the autistic person being included and everybody else benefit from the interaction. Uh, so th there has to be meaningful engagement uh, on both sides uh, with each other. And in doing so, to make this happen, we need to use what I call an abilities-based approach. And that is focusing on what the person can do as opposed to focusing on what they can't do. Mm -hmm. And I've, uh, I've visited with Robert's son uh, a couple of times and went together. We've always had a good time. And uh, the focus is on what can, his, uh, what can Robert's son do? And you know, he's more like us than different. He likes to be with us. He enjoys going on walks. And that's what we do. And we develop a relationship in doing so. Also to uh, amplify uh, uh, Robert's uh, findings uh, reg regarding uh, inclusion, uh, most uh, adults on the spectrum, uh, most people on the spectrum that, who I talk to do report wanting to interact with others, wanting to develop relationships. But the problem is that we're not told how to do it. It's a myth that we don't want to be included. We don't want to relate to others. 
I think what often happens is that there are so many bad experiences, especially in grade school, when attempting to interact, which then goes badly, resulting in bullying and teasing. And it's just a bad experience. So perhaps the autistic person uh, comes to a realization that this whole social interaction thing really isn't worth it because it often, so often turns out badly. So that's why we need education and support for inclusion. In fact, what, what I'd like to further add is inclusion works well when there's the necessary supports. And when those supports aren't present, it's not like you can just put kids together and it automatically works. And also, um, you guys have uh, worked together um, for a long time um, and um, you've done some very, very meaningful work um, with SAP. I know that you've done a project with them. So it would be great to hear um, your successes with that and um, just to, to understand a little bit more about um, how that came to be and what, um, what you guys worked with them on, you know, in terms of inclusion. Boy, we learned a lot. <laughs> we learned so much. I mean, it's five years now. I think that's right. No, Stephen? Yeah. Five yeah. summers ago. And I mean, when we were asked to do this, and, and I think speaking for both of us, we wondered what it would be like doing an intensive training in, in social skills, soft skills for the workplace with 25 individuals in a classroom, eight hours a day, five days a week. Uh, neither one of us had ever done something like that. Of course, we work with individuals with autism individually or in small groups. I think the most I ever had together was five. And there we were, like co-teaching 25 young people with significant autism. And it was amazing the way everyone engaged with us in various formats. We used PowerPoint slides, small groups, large groups, one-to-one -one interviewing, like so much. And everyone engaged enthusiastically. And um, it, it was, and we could see uh, almost people's very expression and, and affect transforming through the week going from being, you know, kind of slumping over to like sitting up straight and um, being really engaged as opposed to withdrawn once they had the opportunity to, to do so. I remember Robert uh, contacting me, asking me if I wanted to do this thing. And uh, again, we had never done this before, uh, but uh, that's no excuse not to try. Uh, so we did, and we got about a uh, couple of dozen uh, young adults on the spectrum interested in IT, and all of them horribly and vastly underemployed or just unemployed, because while they had mastery of the IT component of the job, uh, it was all the other things related to finding and keeping a job that they needed education in. And that's exactly what we did for the 40 hours of training. I mean, we weren't even sure it, we were wondering about the possibility of the room exploding, uh, getting some <laughs> autistic young adults in the same room, but fortunately it didn't. And uh, you know, it, it turned out to be a very positive experience with SAP hiring uh, how many of those? Uh, I think twenty. I think twenty were hired, and that's be and like one moved out of the area. Uh, different things happened, but I think twenty got full full time uh, paid internships. Yeah, so that's a very high ratio, and uh, I think that I think initially they were intending maybe to hire half of them. Wow, that's actually quite an incredible number, isn't it? That just goes to show, and. Um, I mean, what what can you take from um, the, what do you think SAP took from that? You know, what do you think that they learned? You know, obviously, apart from the fact that they managed to um, employ some really great people, what do you think that um, they took away from that? What do you think they may, may have learned from that whole experience with you guys? Well, there was a lot involved that 
you know, some of it preceded our, our involvement. So SAP was already, you know, committed to this. Um, their, their point person, Jose Velasco, who's in charge of their, I guess, North American uh, uh, autism at work or Western hemisphere, uh, has two adult children with autism. He's a software engineer, but this became his full-time job for SAP. And also they, they recruited uh, other, other uh, colleagues there who were going, who mentored people with, uh, with autism who were hired. Plus we also did some training for the managers. So there was really, you know, a lot of people involved in this and plus, so you need a corporate partner to have an autism at work program. Uh, the Arc of Philadelphia was the nonprofit partner. They recruited the individuals. They recruited Stephen and I. Um, and the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation provided job coaching um, after the training was, our training was over, and they were doing on the job training. So there were all these partners. It was a, a huge collaboration of, of different entities. Um, so as we talk about possibly setting up a program like this in another country, we look for the partners that would be needed to make it a success. With your experience in this, and obviously um, the, the great work that you've done with SAP, um, can you tell us um, how organizations can take simple, easy steps towards inclusion? Because I think um, my experience of organizations and who, would not necessarily be opposed to taking steps towards autism inclusion, but maybe feel that it's too much for them. So it's, it's you know, it's a, a massive task that needs to be done all in, in one kind of, uh, kind of turn. Um, so, you know, I think what, what would be great if, if you guys can possibly share with us um, just some general kind of steps that organizations can take to become um, more inclusive without, you know, and take it step by step rather than feeling that they have to, you know, overnight become a 100% inclusive organization. Uh, there's a lot that can be done. It doesn't have to be done all at once. Some things are very simple. And uh, additionally, uh, what, uh, what is good for autistic people tends to be good for everybody else as well. So if we're making environmental modifications to make sure that the lighting is good and that we're using indirect lighting as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, lights hanging from the ceiling and you can see the, the bare bulb glaring down uh, from above, everyone's going to benefit. If we improve the ventilation, everybody makes out in the deal. I've also spoken with a number of supervisors who report that the work that they've done in being better communicators to their autistic uh, employees has made them better supervisors overall. So uh, in it, both in education and in employment, uh, modifications that are made for autistic individuals tend to benefit everybody else. Another example might be, suppose you have an autistic employee and maybe not just autistic, maybe just somebody who who processes information better uh, through text, uh, written text as opposed to verbally. And there's a complicated uh, procedure for running a machine or completing a job. And the supervisor in the past has always uh, instructed the employees verbally on how to do it. Well, it may be that the autistic person would be better served by having a checklist, like a pilot's checklist. And that could be given to the autistic individual. Well, I wonder if that same checklist could be duplicated and given to other people as well, or maybe even better yet, if there's space on the wall, uh, perhaps it could be a poster-sized checklist that everybody could refer to if they needed to do so. And in that way, the workplace is made better for everyone. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephen. And it sounds, you, you know, I mean, I, I, um, I think as, as um, some of the people know that uh, tuning in today, because I've introduced myself before, and I have a son um, who, uh, who has autism, and I, um, 
I feel that a lot of this actually even goes back to, to schools as well, because um, a lot of the, just the things that you've been talking about can really help in classrooms as well for every child, you know, so it really starts, I think in education as well. And it start, you know, it, it can be in any part of your life that, you know, these things can really help, can help everybody. Um, and uh, it's just interesting to hear you hear you talk about that it just helps, um, you know, it, it can help everybody in the workplace or in schools. So um, thank you for that, Stephen, that's great. And um, Robert, what are your thoughts on um, how organizations can, uh, can do better? Just, just to kind of walk this back just a little bit, one of yeah. the things we learned in the process that we heard from corporate leaders was that it's not an altruistic program, that, that they need and want different kinds of minds. And Temple Grandin talks about that in her YouTube, like the world needs all kinds of minds. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and so corporations are benefiting from neurodiverse employees. Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw like, like we got to go back a few times for different events and, and we saw the transformation that had occurred in the young people we met that week. And in, in a sense, like having a job was like the best therapy they ever had. They were, they were, their moods had improved, <laughs> you know, going from, you know, kind of a little uh, uh, resigned to isolation to being energetic and, and positive and connected with people. And, and some of them were making amazing contributions to the, to the work there and were being cited for figuring out all kinds of things that others hadn't. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that, that SAP found out was you didn't just have to recruit autistic people to do tech jobs. They could do all kinds of jobs. They could do clerical reception they could do uh, audio visual they you know whatever whatever wherever their skills were there they could contribute and um and over and over i mean i think the companies that are doing this are not doing it from uh, um while it's humanitarian they're not doing it exclusively from that point of view they want to promote diversity but they also want to be a successful enterprise and people with autism you know having autistic uh, uh, um, workers can actually make your enterprise better and robert is absolutely right with that uh, diversity different people have different strengths and uh, different abilities and it's also a myth that autistic people are all it geeks and in actuality it's a minority of us Yes. So while I support, and it's always good to support all of this autistic uh, super IT geekery, uh, <laughs> it's, it's also important that many of us have skills in other areas. Uh, it could be writing, it could be music, it could be teaching, uh, whatever area there is out there, uh, we could find autistic people uh, being very good at. And at the same mm -hmm. time, we also need to support those autistic individuals who, who need more supports. What about employment for someone who needs more support in communication or for transportation or managing their daily schedule? And uh, there, there are many situations uh, where that's possible. An example I have is a fellow in Florida who, uh, who communicates using by pointing at pictures. Uh, he does need support to get from one place to another. Uh, he needs help with managing his daily schedule. However, he has this curious activity that his parents noticed of taking laundry out of a hot dryer and folding it. And he folds it perfectly. And I know many people who would like help with their laundry. And he would like nothing more than to get into an airplane, which is really just a big sensory integration machine. And come <laughs> right out to where you are. To help you with your laundry. Uh -huh. However, you have to pay him to do it because that is his job. And he spends all day in a hot laundromat pulling clothes out of a hot dryer, folding them faster and better than anybody else. He's appreciated by for society for what he gives and provides to society. And at least as equally important as Robert suggested earlier, 
He's happy with himself. He feels good. He has a job. He's contributing to society. And that's how we need to be including people with various abilities. Really, so, so important. And uh, thanks for sharing that story, Stephen. That's, uh, that's, that's a lovely, lovely story. And, and, and it is actually how it should be. You know, this should be not just one story. This should be every, you know, everybody. Um, and actually, I'd like to um, to ask a question. Uh, actually, as a parent, um, how do we find opportunities for our children? So how do we go about, um, obviously, as you say, these these parents that you were just talking about, this, um, this man in Florida, you know, really realized that he was great. He, he did a great job at folding laundry. So how do we go about um, kind of uh, focusing on a skill, a strength um, that one of these individuals has, and then linking that with um, a possible work placement? Well, I think <laughs> this kind of planning needs to happen early in the child's education. This observing the child's interest in skills, exploring what are possible applications, not being locked into, you know, one thing or the other. Um, it really should be, you know, in the US, uh, we're supposed to do transition planning once a child hits adolescence. But uh, really, we can start thinking about where are they going to fit in society from when they are in elementary school, or very early on. And, and in terms of of seeing those skills and and exploring them and helping a child to develop more not to necessarily be locked into one and it um, takes it takes a lot of commitment i mean parents have driven these programs yes. like like there were parents that drove a parent drove the sap program a parent drove the arc of philadelphia program um parents are intimately involved in florida there's something called the sunrise car wash which is autistic uh, individuals that need a lot more support than the college educated individuals. That was driven by a father. It's managed by a brother of a young man with autism. There's uh, people setting up small businesses, baking, cooking, like all sorts of things. So it takes a lot of parent involvement and, and parent organizations. There's some parent organizations in the Philadelphia area that have set up a coffee shop that employs people, only autistic uh, people there. Actually, we featured that. Uh, if anybody would like to know more about um, the car wash business that Robert's just mentioned, then we, we actually featured that um, as part of our uh, inclusion campaign for April. So if you check out our website, learnautism.com, or check out our social media, then you'll see more of those stories because we've actually been featuring a lot of businesses. Actually, we have had a, um, a question in, and I think it's actually from a parent, actually, um, uh, an autism parent. Um, I'm having a hard time in my workplace to get the buy-in from leadership. Um, they don't want to put a system in place to support um, an autism inclusion program. Uh, what can I do? Well, I think it's a matter. Uh, it begins with selling the strengths and abilities of the autistic person, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on what the person can do. Uh, so for example, uh, um, at four years of age, I started taking apart watches and getting them back together again uh, with no pieces left over and they still worked. Uh, back to Robert's um, uh, suggestion that we need to start early. We need to be observing where the strengths and interests are. Later on, that, uh, that moved on to uh, an interest in bicycles, and taking bicycles apart down to ball bearings and putting them back together uh, again. Uh, after that, it was uh, repairing bicycles. And had things gone differently, maybe I'd be running a bicycle shop as opposed to being a professor. So I think it starts with um, uh, selling the strengths, selling the abilities, uh, providing stories of successful autistic people. Many people think that Bill Gates is autistic and he seems to do, he seemed to do okay with his computer business. Uh, we can always look at Temple Grandin uh, as another example. Uh, there's about 20 examples, uh, at least in SAP, of autistic people making significant contributions. And again, as Robert said, 
uh, it's not a charity. Uh, it's not about um, being, uh, you know, be, being nice to a poor disabled person, but it's including them for business reasons, bottom line reasons. And that is they're doing a job that better than other people can do and they're qualified to do so. And combined with the idea that accommodations, uh, they don't have to be complicated. Uh, you don't have to rent, uh, renovate your office for a million dollars if you bring somebody in who has a disability, but you can start with small things uh, such as the environment, such as uh, developing clarity in communication. So uh, something I'd like to briefly add is okay. autism now is about 2% of the population. If this is a fairly large uh, company or enterprise, they likely have one or more people on the autism spectrum, whether they're diagnosed or not. So if you focus, as Stephen was saying, on strengths and abilities, they're there. And the symptoms of autism are all human qualities. It's just when you have a lot of them and they interfere socially and with daily living that someone is diagnosed autistic. So the more we can show the essential humanity of every autistic person and how that lines up with neurotypical people and make special contributions, that can help organizations begin to, to look at this. But that being said, it doesn't mean everybody's going to move on it right now. And we just have to find the places that are more open to it. So don't give up. And if you're if your company won't do it, see how you can promote this concept in the broader community. But, but most of all, don't give up, keep trying, find an opening. There are openings out here and, and we just need to be persistent. That's how change occurs. Thank you so much, uh, guys. I think we're gonna have to wrap this up now because I know that we're on quite a time schedule this afternoon. Um, you have some very wise words and obviously some amazing experience within this field. And, I really hope that we can continue to highlight all of the amazing work that all of these organizations, um, may it be businesses or schools, are doing, the ones that are really doing an amazing job and really forging ahead. So thank you, uh, Robert and Stephen, for your time today. It's been um, wonderful to talk to you both. Um, you've been an absolute pleasure and thank you for sharing um, sharing your advice and, um, and your experiences. It's been lovely having you, thank you.